I neglected earlier to thank a very, very important group of people here tonight. I, of course, mentioned our staff, but we have a number of volunteers helping us this evening. And volunteers are really the lifeblood of any nonprofit organization for the library company in Northwest 90 Mills. And um, I just wanted to make sure that I recognize our volunteers who are helping us tonight and also upgrade these the elements. What? I wanted to thank our, uh, our sponsors. Um, our direct sponsors are Cornerstone Asset Management, uh, an anonymous sponsor, and also Michael Mann and Rana Chatsil. Our curator sponsors this evening are Peter Bellio and Will Carey, Brown Brothers Herman, Harry S. Sherkin Jr., uh, Freelance Auction House, Louise and Peter Perry, Kelly, excuse me, Louise and Peter Kelly, John Hicks, PNC, um, Al Rosenberg, Al Rosenberg, Saul Ewing, Anna Shipley, Richard Snowden, and John and Christine Van Horn. So thank you to our director and curator sponsors this evening. I also wanted to take a moment. This um, this year has been kind of a rough year um, for the library company and for many cultural institutions in Philadelphia in terms of some of the great names, um, great members we have lost, um, some of our great directors and presidents of the board and supporters um, have passed away over the last year, and they are remembered in the programs. But I wanted to name them here too. Um, and just take a moment to remember them. These are folks who have really stood out in the history of the library company um, as, as people who brought us to this point. Um, Jerry Lankfest was an important supporter and shareholder of the library company, um, and an important supporter of the library company. Spence Toll was president of the library company um, a shareholder, a trustee, a trustee emeritus, um, who was involved with us for almost uh, over 25 years. <laughs> Bill Helfand, another past president of the board, trustee and trustee emeritus. Um, Bill Reese. Uh, we could, we could, we many more. <laughs> Bill Reese was a library company shareholder who passed away this year, but Bill Reese was also uh, an important, um, was really a, a giant in the world of American books, uh, rare books in Americana, and was an important advisor to the library company, uh, an important relationship, and a good friend. Uh, Mary Ivy Bayard passed away this week, an uh, important supporter and shareholder and finally, I wanted to recognize Ted Newbold, um, who was a shareholder at the library company and also a very generous donor um, of his collections and materials. We will miss all of them. Um, and I just am grateful for all of them, what they have done for the library company. So, as you've heard, 287 years ago, a 25-year-old Ben Franklin and a group of his friends decided to start a library. The original Articles of Association they proposed, of the organization they proposed was drafted in July of 1731. But they needed 50 people to pledge 40 shillings to make the idea work. It took them six months to find those 50 people um, to pledge 40 shillings. And you can imagine over those six months, they canvassed and cajoled and buttonholed many people um, to get them to invest what would have been around two weeks' pay in an idea that none of them would have really known. None of them would have known what a library was. Um, there were some libraries in existence in the colonies at that time, but this was a new idea. Hard enough to raise money for a project where people have a clear sense of the benefits. Harder still for such an abstraction 
can only get a sense of how persuasive Franklin must have been. When the founding document was drafted, it put a 50-year limit on the association, and the scrivener who prepared it commented to the young men that probably very few of them would be alive when that term expired. Um, Franklin, um, 50 years later, would comment happily that many of them actually were still alive. And what a shock to them to realize that here, 287 years later, the company is still healthy and growing and vital. Before the library, though, was the Gemzo. And I think it's important to remember, and I say this a lot, but it's important to remember that the Junto came first. The learning community of the Junto, Franklin's group of friends and associates, came first and the library came second. And part of what an evening like this is meant to recreate for you um, is that sense of a learning community, a sense of kindred spirits who want to learn from each other and with each other. Shortly, we'll be able to share with you the completed document of our strategic plan, which we've been working on over the course of the last year. Um, but I wanted to just, I, I suppose the shortest summary of the plan I can give you, without dragging my comments out any farther, is to say that the central goal of the plan is to energize the learning community that's represented in this room and that's represented by, the, the, that we look back to the Gento as our inspiration for. And over the coming years, I hope to give all of you further experiences to meet the scholars who use our collections, to use our collections yourselves, and to have first-hand experiences with them, and to begin to share with each other your ideas for improving this community and how our past helps to give us a guide for how to navigate this future. I also think it's important to think about the role of the Junto in improving civic life. Franklin's motto for the library company loosely translates into, to serve the community is divine. This wasn't just about preserving knowledge, but it was about forming a community that would come up with ideas that would serve the community. And I think that is something well worth us revive, reviving, and it's really at the heart of the, way, the role that a library, any library, plays in a democracy. Not only what can we learn from each other, but how can we work together to build a stronger community? How can we work together to advance the civic interests of Philadelphia? That is at the core of what we're going to do, and it's at the core of what the library company has been. Um, of course, one of the most important strengths of the library company has been in its staff, as I said before. And I want to spend a moment before we move into dinner, uh, before we move into the rest of the program, to recognize a number of staff members who um, have reached important anniversaries of this year. All of a sudden, the suspense. Uh, the first person I want to recognize is Sarah Weatherwax, um, our curator of prints and photographs. Sarah, would you mind standing for a moment or so? Stand for Sarah, Sarah has worked for the library company since 1993. This is her 25th anniversary of the library company. Um, what I think, um, what distinguishes all of the staff of the library company is their commitment to service and the depth of their knowledge about our collections. But I think Sarah, Sarah's work is especially distinguished in this. And those of you who saw and enjoyed the uh, William Birch exhibition, um, which just closed a few weeks ago, would have seen um, that that was uh, a joint project between Sarah and Jim Green. But um, a lot of Sarah's work is in that exhibition. One of the things about the library company is that between um, Sarah and Erica Piola, the, they have mastered their collection and are such generous hosts with it that their, act, their work with the collection actually expands beyond the library company itself. Their knowledge of the history of images of Philadelphia in particular means that they become, have, are really a valuable resource in helping scholars and interested people navigate the collections of collection beyond our own. Um, they're the people who can really help you navigate not just our collections, but those at the Philadelphia History Museum, or the Free Library of Philadelphia, or HSP, and have become an important resource to the city. Um, Sarah is often behind the scenes, but her knowledge of our collections and the collections around the city have been a really important anchor for and, and resource for 
people throughout the city. And we're incredibly grateful to have her and to have been the recipient of so much of her great work over these years. The second person I want to recognize is Charlene Knight. This, where are you, Charlene? Charlene um, is, it would not be enough to say that Charlene, sit the front desk, is our receptionist. Charlene is really, she's the first face that visitors to the library company see. She's the first person they encounter, and she does so every day with unfailing kindness, friendliness, courtesy, helpfulness. Um, uh, my wife is especially fond of Charlene because Charlene went so far out of her way to be generous and welcoming to her and our first uh, days with the library company and she likes to call her uh, the first lady of the library company. Erin wasn't able to be here tonight. She stuck out in Mount Airy. Um, but I am just so grateful to have Charlene working with us because she presents the best side of the library company to the people who walk into its door every day. That friendliness, emphasis on service, courtesy, knowledgeability, and kindness. And we just thank you, Charlene, for all of you. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank Jim Green. Um, Where is Jim? <laughs> this year marks Jim's 35th anniversary with the library. Um, in the first few months I worked at the library company, I made sure, and I still try to make sure to talk to all of the fellows who come through. And um, I asked them, so what makes the library company different? What, what do we do really well? And what so many of them will say is, I came to the library company thinking I was going to look at this book and this newspaper and this thing, but I talked to Jim and he sat down with me and he told me about these three other things I need to look at. And it changed my dissertation, it changed my book. Jim brings to his work as librarian a generosity of spirit, a generosity with his knowledge that has makes him a critical figure in uh, 18th century history in that field, um, and a much beloved figure and an incredibly important part of and, and really centerpiece of the library company's family. Uh, at, not long after taking the job, I asked a friend who I went to graduate school with, who was a fellow of the library company several years ago, I said, you know, so what would you do if you were me? What if you ran the library company? What would you do? And she said to me, I would just ask Jim and Connie what they would do. <laughs> um, I think, you know, for many of our scholars, Jim is the library company. And that his depth of knowledge and the generosity with which he shares it is the hallmark of what the library company offers to its researchers and to the public. So thank you, Jim, for all of your work. Started off as a uh, as an investigative started off as an investigative uh, journalist, uh, working for Philadelphia Magazine for a period of time. Uh, served as the editor in chief of Philadelphia Magazine. He is an award-winning journalist who has had articles published in uh, Gentleman's Quarterly in GQ, Gentleman's Quarterly Magazine, Rolling Stone where he talks about music and I didn't even get a chance to ask him what he was talking about in music. Uh, he's written for the Ladies Home Journal, uh, and he is, uh, he's written for the Washington Post magazine. Uh, he has been recognized and honored in the field of journalism for a very long time. And back, I would say back in the 90s, uh, he did a tremendous investigative piece on uh, on a woman who lost 10 children 30 years ago allegedly uh, by natural causes. 
this woman had children that were dying from anywhere from the age of two months, the age of ten months, and kept having children one after the other. The uh, Philadelphia Homicide Department, of course, investigated it, and the Philadelphia ME's office took a look at the case, and uh, they really, I have a feeling, in my own mind, I think it was a forensic pathologist, uh, not practice in my own mind, but they were not able to uh, come to any conclusions about the cause of the death. Stephen reopened that case, investigated it, and as a result of the incredible article that he wrote, Philadelphia Police Homicide Detectives then interviewed the mother 30 years after the last death of her last child, and she confessed. That was an incredibly important ending to a great mystery that had existed for a very long period of time. It also caused an awful lot of attention to uh, be given to sudden infant death syndrome and into, uh, and of course, into this woman's incredible psychotic psychopathy. She killed eight of her ten children. Two of them died of natural causes. Eight were murdered by her, and she continued to have those children. And Stephen was responsible for bringing that case back to everybody's attention, taking it out of cold storage, and having that person uh, actually answer for that crime. And so, a truly remarkable piece of investigative journalism. And for that, uh, he was given the medical honor by the VDOC Society, if that's the way you pronounce it, and I'm not entirely sure, but by the VDOC Society, which is an elite society. He's the first journalist to ever win this award. It's an elite society of criminologists, pathologists, and police investigators gave Stephen that, that tremendous award. He also, as a result of that article and another article about uh, the Right Aid family, uh, he also won the Headliners Award for uh, best for feature articles on uh, related, um, actually not related, on different topics. And uh, he is also he also won two magazine award, national magazine awards for his investigative journalism, one of which uh, dealt with uh, a pill, an antibiotic that his wife, who I had the pleasure to meet and talk with throughout dinner, took one single pill of, a, of an antibiotic called Fox. She had a horrendous, horrendous reaction to it. And that motivated Stephen to do an investigation into the prescription drug industry. And he did a remarkable three-part series in the Philadelphia Magazine that exposed the FDA's weaknesses the FDA with the prescription drug industry and also resulted in the FDA paying more serious attention uh, to drug safety. And that is another thing that he accomplished, and that was part of his national, that was one of the National Magazine Award recognitions. But you know what? The guy doesn't stop. He decided he wants to write books. And so he's written seven books. I'm not going to go through all of them because we are all, all are on a tight schedule. But I'm going to say this. In 1993, Stephen Free wrote a book about the model of Giacarangi, a thing of beauty. And in that book, he coined the word fashionista. That's right. And I can tell you, in our 287 years, and I've been here through almost all of them, <laughs> speakers at our annual dinner, there isn't a single one that I'm aware of, allegedly, who has had a word that he made up included in the Oxford English Dictionary. 
Fashionista is there. He is credited with it. What he means changes from day to day. Nobody really knows at the time he actually did know. Uh, and so that, that was his first book in, in 1993. He wrote books from 1993 to 2018. The, the two books that, I've read three of his books. I've read Rush, which we'll talk about for two seconds very briefly before I introduce him. Uh, and uh, I read the book, The New Rabbi, which is extremely personal. Stephen's father died. Stephen started to take another look at his religion, which is Judaism. And it's at the same time, Afsalochus, that's a uh, Yiddish, and Stephen knows what that is, but probably not everybody does. Uh, but as luck would have it, that's what it means. As luck would have it, uh, Harzan, which is a major synagogue in the main line, but also just a major synagogue in the nation, was looking for a new spiritual leader because the rabbi, Jerry Wolpe, was retiring after 30 or 35 years of incredible service. The rabbi was a fabulous guy, and Stephen decided to write a book about what it takes to replace a spiritual leader uh, in a congregation such as this. The book is extremely fascinating. It is it just a great deal of take, and it takes us through his spiritual journey, and it also takes us through the roller coaster ride of picking a new rabbi in a synagogue that is packed with uh, very influential people who uh, were very used to a spiritual leader who was extremely charismatic. The other book that I am almost finished, and I, and I recommend very, very highly, is uh, Appetite for America, and it's the story of Fred Harvey, and as uh, Stephen himself says, I believe in his introduction to the book, who the hell is Fred Harvey? <laughs> and the answer to that is, this guy was an amazing guy. He was the, basically the, the founder of the first hospitality empire in the United States, and he did it from the, uh, by going from railroad station to railroad station, from the, uh, along the Santa Fe Railroad line, all out west, making just a tremendous, tremendous service, tremendous food, and it's a fascinating story that I, that I commend to you all. And that takes me to the third book of Stevens that I've read, which I, which I really love. Uh, and that's Rush. I'm going to let Stephen talk and tell us all about Rush. I'm not going to tell us too much about him, except for one thing. When I was reading the book, it seemed to me that... Do you remember the Woody Allen movie, Zelig? But for those of you who do, Zelig was ever... Zelig was standing next to Woodrow Wilson when uh, during the Versailles Peace Conference. Zelig was... He was in every major historical thing that happened in the span of his lifetime, and even beyond the span of his lifetime. When I was reading this book, I was thinking really of Zelda, because Benjamin Rush is standing next to George Washington in the boat crossing the Delaware. Benjamin Rush is standing next to John Adams on Chestnut Street. Uh, Benjamin Rush is standing inside Independence Hall, putting his name on the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Rush is involved in the Constitution. Benjamin Rush becomes the American Hippocrates. Benjamin Rush puts John Adams and Thomas Jefferson together. Benjamin Rush is hanging out with all of these guys. Everywhere you turn in every important event in our nation's family, you will find Benjamin Rush, which was truly remarkable to me because I did know who Benjamin Rush was, but I had no idea who Benjamin Rush was, really was, until I read Stephen's book. Fabulous book, I recommend it, and now I ask Stephen Free to tell us about it.
I said how. I mean, he's actually read more of my books than most of my family members. <laughs> so thank you. Some of my family members are here. You can tell them about it. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and just for this whole evening. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody involved with the library company who's been so helpful to me over the five years that I worked on this book. Um, I want to specifically thank somebody who didn't get thanked before because obviously it's just the anniversary of this year. Where's Ann McShane? Um, you don't want to know what I put Ann McShane through. Um, over the summer, uh, the library company was kind enough to allow us to do, please stand up, was kind enough to allow us to do many of which come from the library company's collection. Um, and Anne had to find them and digitize them, often uh, in like two seconds. Uh, not only for the book, but then I wrote a piece for the Smithsonian Magazine uh, that was adapted from the book, and then she had to find even more images for the Smithsonian. So um, thank you, Anne, thank you, Jim, thank you, Mike, thank you, everybody who worked with us on the book. And um, I'll, now I'll tell you the things that Hal hasn't told you about my children. Um, so uh, while you people, uh, because you're associated with the library company, uh, know a little bit about Benjamin Rush, uh, a lot more people recently have gotten interested in that. <laughs> um, uh, this animation was made by my nephew, Eli, on his way to film school last year. Uh, but I do think it captures, you know, the founders were really worried what would happen if um, somebody really wrote everything that Benjamin Rush really knew. So uh, I spent the last year, five years, writing about him. And uh, the reason was, you know, when, when I switched, um, I would, as you heard, I was a journalist and wrote contemporary articles and books for a number of years. And when I switched to, um, to history, I figured it was only a matter of time before I would write about the revolution because uh, my wife and I lived down the street from the revolution. Um, and until we started this, knew almost nothing about it except um, all the Benjamin Franklin impersonators, the horse and buggies that get in front of your car, um, and it embarrasses other things that make us kind of love hate sometimes the historical area. So um, this is just so you know, it's really hard to get your head around this idea, and I'm not used to being so far from my slides. But uh, everything that happens in this book, and everything that happened in Benjamin Rush's life, and everything that happened during the American Revolution happened when Philadelphia ran from the river to Eighth or Ninth Street and from race to pie, because that's, that's it. Um, and um, that little X at the bottom, that's where Diane and I live. Um, and so I, I figured that eventually I would uh, find an American Revolution subject. And um, I really did not know much about Rush, except that uh, I cover mental health a lot, and I had been told that Rush was the founding father of American mental health. But the people who told me that didn't know why. Um, and in fact, all I really knew about his contribution was that his picture was on this tote bag um, <laughs> that I got at the, um, in 1994 when the American Psychiatric Association had its 150th um, convention here in Philadelphia because Philadelphia is the birthplace of American psychiatry. So um, I didn't want to just write a book about somebody because he was on a tote bag. So I started doing a little bit of research. And the things I found about Rush were very interesting. One was that he really had not been written about very much. Uh, and most of what had been written about him uh, was pretty old school when you would not read it on purpose unless you were in the class and somebody made you. Um, I also realized that his life, if I covered it properly, would really allow me to write about the entire revolutionary period up through the federal period into the, all the way to the War of 1812. Because Rush was younger than the other founders. Uh, he was in his 20s when the first Continental Congress came here. And he lived through that entire period, died in 1813. So you get the whole story of the country, which he was sort of a zealot-like character to, and also very involved. And he signed the Declaration, he helped ratify the Constitution, so he wasn't just watching. The other thing that I realized, and actually explained some of the things about the library company's collection, is that a lot of the parts of Russia's story, some of the best parts, were actually deliberately suppressed by his family. Uh, they were suppressed in part because Adams and Jefferson asked them to suppress it during the time after Russia's death but probably did not realize that they would stay suppressed for over 100 years. And the Rush family collection got broken up because of that. The library company has like 100,000 pieces, but it's not everything. And there's a reason that these collections, these pieces are spread all over the place. And also, why some of the better parts of the story were not written about 
uh, during the books that were written about Rush. So I started um, with the Ur texts of Rush, which um, are these two books, a two volume set of Rush's papers that was published in 1951, and uh, a, a single volume of his autobiography, which was published in 1948. These are the pristine ones that I bought on eBay to put on my shelf to make it look like I was a historian. <laughs> and these are the copies that I actually used to show that I am a historian. Uh, uh, but, but almost every, every book about Rush is out of print, so you actually have to get them in libraries or buy them on eBay. So after we started looking, at, looking into Rush, the first thing we wanted to find out was what did Rush look like? And it's hard. I mean, not everybody knows what Benjamin Rush looks like, and a lot of the images of Rush don't look like each other. So these are the two best-known portraits of Rush. They really don't look a lot like each other. Um, there are many copies of the later one, uh, because Rush taught the first 3,000 medical students in America, and after he died, many of the students wanted his portrait to hang in their offices. Uh, they would have been probably appalled, since they were all against smoking, that he would end up in a cigar box. Um, <laughs> And if you have that cigar box, it's worth a lot of money. Um, but there's all, this, all these other images of Rush, and I, I swear none of them look like the same guy. Um, and there are also sculptures of Rush, one of which is in your collection, and none of them look, they, they all look like the same guy because they're all copies of the same sculpture, but they don't look like the guy I was seeing. So I finally came across this statue. Uh, this statue um, was originally given by the American Medical Association, Teddy Roosevelt, as the first statue of an American doctor to be in Washington. This is a copy of it, which is, which is at Dickinson College, uh, which I sat under during a conference that Dan Richter had me invited to. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, it was part of my early education in Rush. But it was the first image I saw of Rush that actually looked like a person that I could look in his eyes and sort of have an idea what he looked like. And then we found uh, out of print, never published images of him that really dovetailed with it. So this is actually the earliest image of Rush that we found uh, in a gallery in New Orleans. Um, it's actually this big, so it's a miniature copy from another miniature. This just go out. Yeah. You're still here, okay. Yeah. And um, the reason it's important, first of all, is that you know Rush is important because he was young. Rush was younger than the other founders. He was uh, a kid whose father was a blacksmith and died when he was five. His mother uh, worked in a package goods store that she owned on Market Street, down the street from Benjamin Franklin's printing press. Um, he succeeded because he was brilliant. And in fact, people would joke, he has this far, high forehead that people said, it seemed like it was just cr so crammed with stuff um, that was just sort of leaping to get out. Uh, but the young Rush is the one that sort of both captivated, fascinated, and sometimes drove crazy. Um, the doctors, the family fathers, you know, because he was just a, this very interesting, very uh, fast writing and, and full of um, opinions. Uh, and he talked a lot, which is why I'm a perfect um, person to write his biography. <laughs> and so we found this picture, and this really looked a lot like the picture of the statue. And then we found this picture, is it coming? Um, in the house of one of Russia's uh, descendants down in uh, Chester County. Uh, I would not uh, necessarily recommend um, hanging a priceless portrait of Benjamin Rush over your working fireplace. Uh, but they did, and we found this picture, and it, uh, we restored it a bit, and that became uh, the cover of our book. So uh, now that we knew who Rush, what Rush looked like, we started looking into who he was. And you know what's amazing is that you know Benjamin Rush did live many lifetimes of accomplishments. So I was lucky enough; I was te I teach at Penn, and we were able to get nine students who spent a year with me, just going through the Rush canon, trying to make a list of all the things we were supposed to write about, all the things he had done, all the things he had written, um, all the things he had witnessed. Um, this is one part of one page of what was a 49-page single-space document uh, that we put together of all the things that we thought Rush was going to get us to. This only gets up to when he's 30 and signs the declaration. And we went through everything uh, from his writings to even the library company has these, his doodles. Um, Rush was quite a doodler, and the ledgers that he has that are here um, are wonderful and include some of, uh, actually, the only portrait of his son is a doodle that he made. Um, so as, as we began this process of trying to process everything and turn it into writing that we would read on purpose, we actually had many discussions in that class about how do you make history writing that is accessible to people, um, that's historically perfect, but also accessible to people. We then went back over all the characters who we were going to have to bring to life through Rush. Um, 
First, Benjamin Franklin, who rushed, as I said, lived down the street from him, and never, we have no evidence that he met him in Philadelphia. He met him in London when he was in medical school at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and Franklin gave him this great opportunity. He gave him letters of introduction to basically all the living writers who Rush had read in, college, in high school and college. Rush was given the introduction so he could have dinner with them. Um, and he met all, you know, all these amazing people in London and Paris and wrote journals about it. And then uh, very much, you know, I think that he hoped when he grew up he would be the next Benjamin Franklin. Um, and I think in a lot of ways that, that is actually what he became. Uh, he met John Adams in 1774 when the Massachusetts delegation first came to the Continental Congress. Um, and Adams and he did not actually like each other that much when they first met. Uh, Adams noted that he talked a lot. Um, and, uh, but he did actually warn Adams about people in Philadelphia that they would say they were for independence, but they weren't. Um, and he wanted to make sure that he understood that Philadelphia had the most to lose because of independence. And so he gave Adams a lot of advice that Adams only later realized was good. He also met George Washington during the first Continental Congress. And we have great descriptions from Russia from other people, not only what they did, what they talked about at dinner, what they ate. Adams always wrote down what they ate. Um, so when Adams ate at Russia's house, he made a note that Rush served really good melons. Um, and uh, so uh, Rush was, uh, but Rush was still to these people a young doctor who seemed like an interesting guy. And um, they ate at his house. Um, then in the fall, in the summer and fall of 1775, Rush got involved with the gentleman on the left. That's Thomas Paine. Um, the writers always have the good hair. Um, uh, Rush had, uh, Rush, Rush had started a pamphlet on independence, um, but he previously published a pamphlet on that was not only against uh, slavery, but uh, called out people for being prejudiced against free blacks as well, which had hurt his practice very much. He decided that um, Thomas Paine, who was a freelance writer, had much less to lose if he wrote the pamphlet of independence instead of him. So they actually worked together. Paine wrote, uh, Rush edited with him, and um, they, uh, I mean, Payne wrote the pamphlet, which came out in 1776 as the, with the title that Rush gave it, Common Sense. Uh, Payne had been calling it something else. Uh, Rush also met during this time period Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, we know that Thomas Jefferson was writing the Declaration of Independence. That's something that's well documented. Uh, the thing that I found really fascinating, but it was at the same time, of course, every state was writing their own Declaration of Independence during that time. Rush was writing the one for the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, we also meet the Stockton family, Rush's in-laws. So the woman on the left is Rush's wife, Julia Stockton Rush. Uh, he married her when she was 16. Uh, he was 30 because his parents told him that his mother told him that she, he could not marry until he was 30 uh, because she had spent a lot of money on his education. He needed to support his family. So part of the reason we know about all his girlfriends who he couldn't marry and his, his, his private life is because he wrote about them a lot about all the women he was not allowed to marry. Um, he actually knew Julia Rush from almost from birth uh, because Ru Julia's parents, Richard Stockton and Anne Spudno Stockton, uh, Richard Stockton uh, was the most powerful lawyer in New Jersey. Uh, his family had given the land for Princeton, which is where Rush went to college. Uh, he went to Princeton as a junior at the age of 14, graduated at the age of 15, um, and he met the Stocktons. Uh, he was impressed with Richard Stockton, but he was really fascinated with his wife. Anne Spudno Stockton was a poet. First, a woman to publish, uh, first American woman to publish in America poetry. And Rush had already been part of um, a group that I think was the next generation of the Junto, which was a co ed salon uh, with Betsy Graham Ferguson, uh, which Rush went to as a young man, and many couples went to. Um, and uh, that's where he got to know who Anna Stockton was. So uh, we have actually Rush's courtship letters with Julia. They're at the Rosenbach Museum, Julia. Rush, Bill, Henry donated them in the 1970s there. Uh, one of the great things about them, uh, and we really see Rush as sort of a young, I don't want to say a feminist, it seems like from a different time, but somebody who really appreciated, I thought it was important that women be educated. Uh, in one of his letters, he describes um, the library that he's building for Julia in the house that she's going to come and live in, and the first hundred books that he bought her so that they could discuss them, and, uh, which my, my female researchers refer to as the first woman cave. <laughs> uh, Rush also, um, and this very much ties in with your collection in terms of medical history, was the student of the two most important early doctors who started the first medical school in, in Philadelphia, John Morgan on the left and his uh, friend turned arch enemy William Shippen Jr. on the right. Uh, these were Rush's teachers. 
they came to despise each other. Uh, Rush had, oh, they fought over and everything, but they started over fighting up who started the medical school. Rush had to figure out how to negotiate the two of them. This wouldn't be such a big deal, except later George Washington hired them both to run the military medical system during the Revolutionary War, during which they continued to fight like cats and dogs um, to the point where Morgan was forced to be court martial. And Rush always, always found himself in the middle of this. And we also get to know characters that people don't always associate with Benjamin Rush. This is Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. Uh, Rush uh, knew them, members of the black clergy. He helped write the plan for the first black church in Philadelphia. And um, they were involved, obviously, in the yellow fever epidemic. But he was involved in both what ended up being their two churches and um, raised the money. One of the plan for the church was at the for openings of these churches. Uh, we were very lucky um, during the time that we were researching this. Obviously, Richard Newman was here at the library company, one of the world's experts in this. And Richard agreed to have private sessions with me and my researchers where we could ask him the stupidest questions possible so that they would be, because they were questions that you just could not figure out from the literature and uh, about Allen, about the history of slavery, just trying to tease out things that are not written, but we needed to better understand. We were very grateful to the time that he gave us. You also, in Rush, get to meet this guy. Um, and I will say that in Benjamin Rush land, when we see a picture of Alexander Hamilton, we hiss. So I would like to hear a hiss for Alexander Hamilton. Come on, you can do it. Come on. Now, I know Alexander Hamilton has recently hired better publicists. <laughs> um, and there are some songs about him, I understand. Um, but Benjamin Rush and Alexander Hamilton really did not get along. Their lack of friendship is epic. Um, extends over many, many years. Uh, even though they were neighbors, uh, they and their wives got along, and their kids were actually very good friends. And uh, we actually found during the research if I could make this laser thing work. Let's see. I'm not even, I'm not even gonna try what it looks like again. Um, if you look at it, this is 1790 census, and if you look in the middle, you can see Dr. Benjamin Rush, and his name's crossed out because Alexander Hamilton moved into his house at Third and Walnut. It says Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury. Um, so they had, a, they had an epic uh, thing that went on for years and years, um, which you don't read about a lot in the uh, Hamilton book, but you read a lot about in my book. The, the other, I would say the other main character in this book is Philadelphia. The reality is, is that this is the birthplace of America, but almost every book about the revolution is based in Boston or Virginia. Uh, and Philadelphia sort of gets short shrift, even though, from what I recall, almost everything that mattered happened here. So I really took great care. And the other thing is that except for when he went to medical school, Rush was always here. So Rush actually gives you an eyewitness to everything that was happening in Philadelphia during this whole time period. And he was really there at the London Coffee House talking policy at the City Tavern, which you can still go to eat at a, at a version of, and at Pennsylvania Hospital. So check out this painting. This is the most mind-blowing thing that I saw visually in this whole book. That's what Pennsylvania Hospital looked like when Rush lived there. When Rush worked there. So if you're looking at that green, that's um, Lombard Street and South Street and Bainbridge Street, all that green. Um, so there was only one building at that time that the building that faces on 8th Street. Rush also was um, involved in many important events. He, he, was, he was voted into the Continental Congress only weeks before he had the opportunity to sign the Declaration of Independence. This is uh, one of the most famous paintings of that in the circle. And he actually also gave great witness to the signing because Rush is a really good writer. He wrote very much for the common man. He, looked, he, fought, he paid attention to human details. His description of the signing combines both in capturing the incredible darkness and danger that the guys realized they were signing their lives away, but also some humor. He noted um, that two of the signers, one a very heavy set man, and the other a very skinny guy who was actually Eldridge Gary, who, who invented Gary, Jerry Man, right? Jerry. Um, went up to sign, uh, and the big guy said, Jerry, you know, when we are killed for this, uh, for do for signing this, you know, when I'm howling, I'm going to die like, really fast. Uh, when you are really skinny, and you're going to dangle for a really long time. <laughs> so literally gallows humor. And um, I think, you know, I don't know why exactly, but, you know, Rush's brother was John Hancock's assistant, so that may be why Rush uh, got such a good signing position on the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Um, and, uh, or maybe they're so happy that the Pennsylvania people were finally signing it. Uh, Rush was also with Washington the night before the crossing of the Delaware Hall. I'll have to fact check you on that. Uh, he was with Washington the night before. He described the scene of being in Washington's tent 
and Washington having in his hands a paper that said victory or death on it. He then was sent by Washington with orders back to the Pennsylvania troops, because there were four groups of troops along the Delaware that were going to cross that night. Washington's group got across first. Uh, Russia was with the group from Pennsylvania that got across later, but he described it in wonderful detail. And he was involved, and he was supposed to be in Congress, but he kind of wandered away from Congress. His wife was pregnant. He, had, he put her in a safe place because he wanted to be with the troops. He wanted to take care of troops. So he ended up taking care of troops after the Battle of Trenton. Um, he met General Hugh Mercer in the aftermath of the Battle of Trenton, not knowing that he would be treating him and soon burying him. Uh, but several days later was the Battle of Princeton. And imagine what it was like for Rush to return to Princeton and watch the fighting in front of Nassau Hall, where he had gone to college, uh, where the Americans were trying to take Nassau Hall back from the British. Uh, this is one of the more ridiculous paintings um, in terms of its accuracy, because if you can see it in the upper right hand corner, that's supposed to be George Washington and John Cadwallader from Pennsylvania, and Benjamin Rush, third, brandishing a sword in the middle of this fight. Of course, Rush never brandished any sword in this fight, but it's good that he got a good position in the painting. Uh, he's also, in this famous painting, which hangs uh, in Princeton, uh, where he's holding uh, General Mercer. So Mercer was. Mercer surrendered, and the British bayoneted him seven times afterwards anyway and smashed him in the head. And Russia literally just met him the other day, was treating him. Mercer was a doctor. Mercer tried to convince Rush that he was going to die, and Rush was certain he wouldn't. Uh, Mercer was right. Um, <laughs> Mercer bled out, and he bled so profusely that there's still a blood stain in the building that still exists um, in Princeton that he died of. Um, and so Rush was in the middle of all this. These are some of the tools that Rush and other doctors used during this time. Medical medicine was a lot of cutting things off that were already dangling. Um, and there was a good bit of bloodletting because there were very little known that they could do. Their treatments were taking blood out of the system if the pulse was too strong. Uh, they used bark, they used uh, wine as, a, uh, as a medicine. And Rush lived through uh, these incredible first rounds of battles of the war. Um, he was also at the Battle of Brandywine uh, after being voted out of the Congress. Um, and becoming Surgeon General for the uh, Surgeon General for the uh, for the Army. So the Battle of Brandywine. This is also another ridiculous painting. Um, none, nothing in this painting actually happened. Uh, what actually did happen at the Battle of Brandywine, which was one of the worst defeats in the Revolutionary War, was that Rush and other doctors were in this meeting house, the Birmingham Meeting House, uh, to take care of patients because in Washington's plan, you can see that. Um, there's just a need to chat for it and fight and bang it out. Um, and Rush, whereas the Birmingham meeting house was supposed to be out in the middle of nowhere, but Washington didn't realize that half of the troops were going to go up and around. And so while Rush and his fellow doctors are trying to save people's lives, they hear like the fifes and the drums coming from the wrong direction. Uh, because the British are coming up behind them to sneak attack the uh, Americans. And Rush, in that hospital, ended up being right in the middle of it. Rush ended up being kidnapped. Uh, he was released. Uh, but these were bad wars, um, and Rush lived through many of them. The Battle of Germantown, especially bloody. And then the Battle of Fort Mifflin, which is so bad they couldn't even get a good painting of it. Um, <laughs> if any of you are dabbling in historical painting, the Battle of Fort Mifflin really needs a good painting. Um, Rush lived through all this, and he was, like many people in America, really worried about the future of the American Revolution. So he started writing to people that he knew, obviously John Adams. He wrote a letter to Patrick Henry which ended up changing his life. He sent this letter to Patrick Henry during the worst part of the war, in which he, he repeated gossip that he had heard from the generals that perhaps George Washington wasn't the guy. Um, and this was not a good thing for him to do because he and George Washington were friends, and uh, because Patrick Henry and Washington were friends. He sent this letter to Washington, uh, to Henry. Uh, he, told, he said it anonymously, he told Patrick Henry to burn it, and Patrick Henry held it for quite a long time. He also sent a letter that we just discovered, actually. There it is. He sent a letter that's at the Rosenbach Museum to his wife. Um, and this, in this letter, it's very clear. You can say, I thank you for your hint. His wife is obviously telling him to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bad thing in the middle of the war to be saying to the, the top general, he's not maybe the right guy. So your hint about General Washington, I uh, take it as a sign of your affection for me. But then he points out you know, that Basically, everybody in the Pennsylvania delegation already agrees with him, which is not true. Um, but so that he was going to be silent, and you can see he underlined silent. Uh, and then for the next four pages, he went on, on and on and on about what a terrible general in Russia was, maybe how to replace him. If this letter had ever been caught, Russia's life would have been in a much worse place. 
um, but it was never seen. And interestingly, Washington and Rush kind of made up because Rush was mostly mad at Washington because there wasn't enough money coming for the, to treat his patients. And then two months later, Patrick Henry gave Washington a letter. Uh, we don't really know why. Um, and Washington knew who wrote it because he regularly corresponded with Rush, and he never forgave Rush. And this actually hung over not only Rush's whole life, but Rush's afterlife. And part of the reason that Rush isn't as famous as he could be today is because his family didn't want anybody to find out about that. Uh, he went home. Um, the British had just left Philadelphia, and he had started his life over. He and his wife had many children. He worked on in hospitals. He worked developing education. He also it was very, very important to him to note that while the war was over, which had finally ended, to him the American Revolution was just starting. And what was really going to be important, similar to the way Franklin saw things earlier, was not just the laws they were going to pass, but the voluntary associations, the groups they were going to start, the institutions they were going to start, to take care of what it was going to be like to be an American. What it would it be like if you were independent, if you didn't have a didn't have a king anymore, you didn't have a state religion anymore, and you had to really make these decisions yourself. Um, so you focus on uh, education, on fighting for equality in religion, gender, and race. Um, and uh, the first thing that he did was he started Dickinson College. Dickinson College was started out in Carlisle because they wanted to have a rural college, all the other colleges were in the middle of cities. And uh, he got the first charter for the school. He later started uh, Franklin College, which became Franklin and Marshall College, uh, for a reason, are there alums from Dickinson and Franklin Marshall that would like to get up and sing the songs now? <laughs> there you go. Um, so he started Franklin College for a really interesting reason that's that especially interesting given our current state of immigration laws. Um, he started Franklin College to be a German-speaking college because German immigrants who didn't speak English thought deserved education as well. Um, and he was also involved in the founding of uh, the first school that would teach women uh, similarly to men at a high school level. He released a plan uh, for the first public schools and really wrestled with the ideas of what would schools be like if they weren't run by churches? Uh, what would be the place of religion? What would be, uh, you know, how would this all work? And um, so uh, he also did obviously a lot of medical writing and I want to highlight now uh, one of his most interesting pieces. He wrote a lot about alcoholism uh, because he saw that as actually one of the worst things that he saw in Pennsylvania Hospital in terms of the sick people there. But interestingly, he wrote a lot about temperance and became known as the father of American temperance. But in the 1700s, temperance um, didn't include wine and beer. <laughs> so you can see in his chart of temperance over here, uh, you know that uh, the, the water and small beer and beer and wine are all associated with cheerfulness, with strength, with you know nutrition. Uh, they're great for you. Benjamin Rush um, had drank three glasses of wine every day of his life. And he wrote this, um, Pay into Wine and Its Importance in Health, uh, which I will read to you. Wine is principally useful to old people, or such as are in the decline of life. At a medium, the body begins to decline at the age of 45 or 50. Then the hot fit of the fever of life begins to abate, and from the many disappointments in love, friendship, and ambition or trade, which most of men meet with by the time they arrive at this age, they generally feel a heavy heart. Here, wine prolongs the strength and powers of nature. It is the grave of past misfortunes. In a word, it is another name for philosophy. <laughs> Remember my age years. If you would expect to enjoy a long reprieve from the infirmities of age, you must begin to use wine moderately and increase the quantity of it as you descend. <laughs> You're in big trouble. Uh, you will be perjury, burglary, murder, suicide. It causes every major disease. You could end up dangling from the gallows. Um, this actually, his moral uh, temperance, uh, this poster is one of the best known Benjamin Rush uh, pieces. They have one of the library companies. It's, it's republished all the time. One typical thing, you know, Rush wrote not only for, he wrote for magazines. So he, was, he always saw what he was doing as popular writing. Interestingly, he and his wife did some writing together, which I love. We actually found this in the uh, files of Lyman Butterfield, who was the top Rush scholar, who was going to write a book before he died, and thank God I was able to use his notes. Um, uh, but he, uh, here, I want to, I can't get over there to read some of the bigger here. So, 
uh, Julia wrote a list, um, a, a list of my husband, Dr. Rush's faults, kept by me, Julia Rush, wife of the above named Dr. Rush. He is too passionate, he's too impatient in health, too peevish in sickness, he suffers his servants to do as they please, he gives too little attention to the children, suffers everybody to cheat him, he neglects to collect his debts, and he is way too preoccupied with Dickinson College. <laughs> To which, uh, to which Rush replied, he couldn't think of anything really bad to write, but he wrote a list of Mrs. Rush's excellent qualities, taken down by me, her husband, uh, Benjamin Rush. And uh, I won't read all of them, but she sews well, she makes all her children's clothes, she understands perfectly the composition of all the different kinds of pudding. All the different kinds of pudding. She can preserve meat by smoke or salt. In fact, her bacon recipe is at the Rosenbach Museum. If you, like, if you have 330 pound pigs, that you're trying to figure out what to do with, she has the answer. Um, and she made apparently excellent pickles. Um, his only problem with her was that, uh, as you can see, that she had a tendency to put too much wood on the fire. Uh, because being from Princeton and being around a lot of trees, she didn't understand that in the city, wood's expensive. Uh, so during the same time, Rush wrote uh, what is probably his most important uh, piece, and, and uh, I don't want to be humorous about it because it, it, it's, in the work that I do in mental health care, there's nothing more important than this uh, speech that he gave in 1786 at the Philosophical Society, uh, which really is the beginning of us talking about mental illness and, and addiction as medical diseases, um, and not as uh, failures of religious belief or failures of, uh, of, of uh, control. Uh, this uh, is a battle that in mental health and addiction we still have today, actually. We still fight this fight today. Uh, and Rush really uh, spoke eloquently about this, even though he knew that it would be very controversial and it was really the cornerstone of the medicine. Much of the medicine that Rush practiced and taught obviously did not stand the test of time. This was the 1780s and 90s. Uh, but his ideas about mental health and addiction have never been more modern and never been more important. He also wrote a sentence in this piece that I always thought was really important for our understanding of America. Um, he, said, he basically saw the country as being challenged as to balance science, religion, liberty, and good government. And I think in many ways, we still try to figure out how to balance those things today. His interest in mental illness pushed him to make very public entreaties to the Pennsylvania Hospital to create uh, better care for mental health for people with mental illness. At this time, people with mental illness were believed not to be able to feel the difference between hot and cold. So there were no heaters in the cells in the basement of Pennsylvania Hospital where they were being locked to the floor. Uh, they also, um, you were allowed to pay people to go in and see them and talk to them. That's in fact one of the ways that the hospital made money. Uh, so Rush immediately uh, made them stop that and made them raise the money to buy heaters. And his uh, openness to uh, new forms of treatment for mental health led to the building, which we don't think of very much, but that building on 9th Street that faces out on 9th Street, that was the second building in Pennsylvania Hospital was built exclusively for the care of mental illness. And it is the first building in the world that was built only for the modern care of mental illness. We can debate what the modern care of mental illness is. Uh, people still debate it today. But the fact that this happened in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, is an incredibly important thing. And then Rush lived through a period that I think in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, we don't pay enough attention to. We were the capital of the country during most of the Washington administration and during the entire Adams administration. And the drama of that is particularly fascinating. The Rushes who knew all these people before became very much the hosts of the revolution. Um, John Adams' wife went on about how nice it was to have the Russians as friends, because first of all, they didn't treat them as any big deal now that he was vice president, but also Benjamin Rush knew where everything was. He was great gossip, he knew where to get all the best food, he knew how to do everything, and the Russians really hosted them here uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, this is also when Hamilton came, and we'll leave Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> Although Hamlet comes back around because in 1793, Philadelphia has this little yellow fever epidemic. Uh, the worst epidemic in American history. 10% of the population of the, war, of the nation's capital died in less than three months. And Rush found himself in the middle of all this. Many of the doctors fled. Um, he treated patients, um, and along with the black clergy, there was many debates over bloodletting. Uh, Hamilton came out and said that he had yellow fever and somebody besides Rush had cured him. And that was the real cure. That was the federalist cure. Uh, and Russia, because he was a Republican, had the Republican cure. If you think that we invented tribalism in our parties uh, recently, <laughs> trust me, uh, the first time you read in a newspaper from the 1790s, John Adams being called a maggot, um, you realize how divisive politics were the minute they started existing. 
there's actually Julia Rush's letters to Rush during the Yellow Fever were recently discovered in the Philosophical Society. Uh, there are many books that were written, uh, fascinating books that were written during this time. I really wish Philadelphians, this is the, a big anniversary of the Yellow Fever, I wish people would pay more attention to it. And um, then Rush had a whole third act. Um, after the uh, election of 1800, a horrible election uh, in which his two, close, his two close friends, Adams and Jefferson, stopped speaking. Uh, the country's unbelievably divided, and Philadelphia lost everything. It lost the U.S. Capitol, it lost the Pennsylvania Capitol. If you want to know where our love hate for the world comes from, it comes from 1800. <laughs> Philadelphia had never gotten over the fact that we lost so much so quickly. And Rush was particularly devastated by the politics today. He wrote this chilling sentence to try to scare his kids out of getting into politics. In battle, men kill without hating each other. In political contests, men hate without killing. But in that hatred, they commit murder every hour of their lives. And that's really where Rush was at that time. And you know, it's interesting to see how many times the founders were scared to death that they had broken America. Um, it's not just something that we think about today. Um, Rush was the uh, medical advisor for the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, but but so I want to tie up soon because I'd like to take some questions that we have, and I want to tell you just a couple more things about Rush because, as you can guess, I would talk to you all night about Rush. Um, <laughs> And uh, I don't want to do that. So I do want to do it, but I can't. So um, these are Rush's, two of Rush's oldest sons. The one on the left, John Rush, we do not have a portrait of. We only have this doodle that Rush made of him uh, because for a very specific reason. John Rush was Rush's oldest. He was a physician. Rush expected him to take over his practice and take over his teaching. Uh, in 1807, Rush, who was a, John Rush was a Navy surgeon. Um, got into a duel with his best friend on a boat. They were having a fight over a line in Shakespeare. Um, and John Rush was, uh, was challenged to a duel. He accepted he was going to shoot in the air, but at the last minute he was told that his friend would shoot him, so he killed his best friend. He died in his arms. Uh, we have very detailed descriptions of this. And after this happened, John Rush slowly lost his mind, um, to the point where over the next two or three years he tried to kill himself many times. Uh, the Rushes didn't know about this because the doctors down there were people who Rush had trained and they were embarrassed that they couldn't take care of John Rush, the son of famous Benjamin Rush. Uh, but eventually Rush was sent home, uh, hopefully that his father could treat him. He arrived looking like a biblical madman. Um, Rush hoped that treatment at Pennsylvania Hospital would help, uh, but it did not. And John Rush lived at Pennsylvania Hospital as a psychiatric patient for the next 30 years uh, and died there. Rush's next son, Richard Rush, uh, was a lawyer who Rush was afraid would go into politics, uh, and did. In 1812, he became part of the uh, James Madison administration and was the leading spokesperson for the War of 1812. Uh, John Adams expected that one day he would be president. He got pretty close. He, he was uh, John Quincy Adams' running mate for vice president. He was secretary of the treasury. He was attorney general. Uh, he was the US ambassador to Great Britain. And he also was the lawyer who went and brought the money back to start the Smithsonian Institute. Um, which is why the third son, James Rush, who's the one you know because James Rush gave the money uh, to build a library company building. Uh, and in fact, to combine the library company with his father's books, uh, which the day that his father died, James Rush wrote his own name in all of his father's books. Um, and you can see that it's quite fascinating. But if you got stuck spending your entire life giving the lectures of your dead dad, um, which is what this ticket is for. Um, you know, James Rush spent his whole life be, trying to be his father. You would know the challenge. The last part of this book, however, is mostly Adams and Rush. Uh, John Adams, uh, four years after he stopped speaking to both Rush and Jefferson, he reached out to Rush and said, I really think that we should talk before one of us dies. And then began this unbelievable uh, spate of letters over the next eight years, hundreds of letters. Uh, that really retold the entire history of America, that retold their own lives. Uh, the wives loved it. They did this because these two cranky old guys had something to do. Um, the husbands went out to get the mail. They were really excited. Um, Julia Rush actually once said to uh, Benjamin Rush, these letters seem less like the letters of founding fathers than a couple of high school girls writing about their boyfriends. Um, but these letters really allowed Rush and Adams to rewrite the entire history of the country. And they are fascinating letters, and I just really let them go. Uh, and dominate the last part of their part of the book. The one I wanted to read to you, this is uh, Adams bitching about him. Adams was very upset that fame had taken the place of the uh, of kingship in America. He was very afraid of this idea of fame, but also afraid that he wasn't getting enough of it. Um, 
So he wrote, the history of our revolution will be one continued lie from one end to the other. The essence of the whole will be that Dr. Franklin's electrical rod smote the earth and outspring General Washington. And Franklin electrified him with his rod, and thenceforward these two conducted all the policy negotiations, legislation, and war. These underscored lines contain the whole fable plot and catastrophe. If this letter should be preserved and read a hundred years hence, the reader will say the envy of this John Adams he couldn't bear to think of the truth. He ventured to scribble to Rush as envy as himself and blasphemy that he dared not to speak when he lived. Uh, these letters went on for years. Uh, what's most fascinating about them is during the period, Rush decided to use them as a way of getting Adams and Jefferson back together. And he's basically spent years doing founding father family therapy. Uh, try to convince the two of them that they should be friends, uh, which was important to him because he really believed that if the two founders, which he considered them to be the intellectual founders of the country, were going to be divided by politics, what did that say about the future of America that these two couldn't be friends again? And after many years, he did. There's no such thing as a heart emoji um, during that time period. But in 1812, he did force them to start writing again. And after he died, they wrote for another 13, 14 years. Their letters also incredibly significant. Uh, and then before Rush died, um, he knew he was close to death. He decided he wanted to make one more contribution to mental health, and he wrote this book, uh, which is the first American uh, book on mental health care, which came out only months before he died. I'm going to skip ahead here because I want to give my pitch for the library company um, and for the importance of the materials that you hold here and other institutions hold in this city. Um, American history begins in Philadelphia, but you would not know it by the percentage of colonial, revolutionary, confederation, and federal period materials that are held here that are not digitized and that are not easily available. So scholarship on them often has not been updated in decades. Uh, retranscription and interpretation of the writings of the other major founders is still being updated almost every day. Most of writing that Benjamin Rush did has not been updated in nearly 50 years. Um, Benjamin Franklin's Papers Project, um, the director of which is here, Ellen, raise your hand, um, is at Yale. Okay, it's at Yale. It's not in Philadelphia, it's at Yale. <laughs> I just want to say that that's, maybe that's okay for Yale, but that's not so great for Philadelphia, and it's understanding of its place in history. I mean, even John Dickinson, who Rush replaced signing the Declaration, now has his own Papers Project. It's at the University of Kentucky. Okay. We are not doing enough to, to, to take care of our own history and take care of our place in history. I know we lost the U.S. Capitol. I know we're cranky about that. <laughs> but the way that we get over that crankiness is to re-embrace both of our Benjamins in that entire time period, which we do not do a good enough job to do. So my proposal to you is to let's start a Benjamin Rush Papers Project in Philadelphia as a first step to reclaiming and reinvesting in our history and making sure the next generations of students, historians, and history buffs can easily access and study the papers of both of our Benjamins, along with other Pennsylvanians who helped build this nation. And in case you're interested, yes, come on. I'm not saying we should only do Rush, but I think if we start with Rush, his collection is so wide-ranging, it would give us a reason to recapture many things. This is a basic list of the Red Hot Centers of Benjamin Rush stuff. Uh, and you can see there's six, seven institutions in Philadelphia, others around the country, um, who are all very interested in trying to figure out a way to do better on Rush, because doing better on Rush allows us to do better on everything. So I'm gonna stop here and say to you, please feel the rush. Um, uh, I must say it's great to speak to people who've all been given signed copies of my book. It never happens that often. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, and uh, again, I'm really honored to be here tonight, and I want to do everything I can to help the library company and the larger historical community in Philadelphia uh, do better moving into the 21st century for historians, for students, and for those of us who just love American history. Thank you. Yeah.